Welcome to Alternative Investing. I'm Andrew Bell, and here with me, my regular Friday co-host, David Kaufman, president of Westcourt Capital. Great to have you here. Always a pleasure to be here. On this show, we explore investment concepts outside of the traditional realms of stocks and bonds. It's for investors like you who may be sitting on cash and looking for alternative places to put your money, places not in the public markets, but in funds or products that fly a little more under the radar. It can be bewildering. There's lots of choices, such as private equity or hedge funds. And on today's show, we're going to talk about investing in real estate, specifically real estate investment trusts. Uh, Just remind us, David, what is a REIT? A REIT is an investment fund, and that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks, are investment funds, that uh, provides an opportunity for investors to uh, have own a share of a diversified pool of real estate assets and the rents that they throw off. Mm-hmm. And those assets can vary anywhere from office assets, residential, commercial, industrial. So essentially what happens is that you have the REIT will collect, it will aggregate uh, cash from investors, we'll add some leverage to that, we'll purchase income producing real estate mm-hmm. in one of those categories that I just mentioned, and then they'll take uh, the rents out of that, take the expenses and the management fees away, and pay most of the remaining uh, money out to the investors. When the pros look at real estate, what do they focus on? The, the, it depends what side of the real estate okay. balance sheet you're on. So some people look at real estate as an equity, uh, as a capital appreciation play, and others take a look uh, at it as, as an income play. And so the REITs certainly uh, approach it from an income play. And what makes it so impressive from the point of view of the investors, and one reason why so many advisors are interested in REITs, is that the, the rents that flow down to the investors are received as, in most cases, uh, partly as income that is taxed, mm-hmm. but a lot of it is treated as return of capital, which is extremely tax efficient, which makes it tax really efficient at two levels. One is at the level that it is, a, uh, it, that it is not unlike an income trust, mm-hmm. not taxed at the top level. Okay. And then once again, when it arrives in the, it, as return of capital in the hands of the investor, they are not subject uh, to income tax for much of the money that they receive. So you're kind of getting a double tax benefit. We're in the twilight of the trusts. They're winding down, but the REITs have been allowed to survive, so they can pass through a lot of their profits or cash flow tax-free. But then in my hands, it's likely taxed again. Well, it's it's very interesting the way it works. Uh, Revenue Canada has allowed a system to exist whereby the depreciation on the non-land portion of the asset, i.e. the buildings, Buildings, uh, that they allow a 4% on a declining balance basis, 4% can be depreciated every year. Now, when you include the leverage without getting into some of the complicated math, essentially what what that means is so long as the REIT continues to purchase new, new buildings that can be depreciated, that once the money arrives in the investor's hands, because the depreciation offsets from an, from, on, from an accounting point of view that as income, it's treated as return of capital. So the benefit to me is that I don't pay any tax on return of capital today, uh, and the downside is that it will lower my adjusted cost base over time. But that's not a downside compared to paying the income tax today. Uh, tax deferred is tax saved. We've got to take a break. Coming up, we're going to dig deeper into the risks and rewards of investing in the world of apartment REITs. Don't miss the boss of Centurion Apartment REIT next on Alternative Investing. We're back with Alternative Investing. Now, we're looking today at real estate. We're focusing in, though, on investing in apartments, specifically through an apartment REIT. Uh, David Kaufman, of course, of Westcourt Capital, is here as co-host. David, just remind us, for people looking for an alternative investment, why is real estate really good? Okay, well, remembering that one of the key reasons to diversify among asset classes, something we talked about last week, is the decorrelation from the public markets. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, uh, real estate uh, has a very low correlation to the public markets. It can provide, certainly in the case of a REIT, for example, consistent and predictable returns, so the people that are hungry for yield can achieve it. 
Moderate capital appreciation is always a good thing because we look at total returns. When we add the income to the appreciation, we get the total returns. And historically, it's an excellent hedge against inflation. And what all of that means is that if you have the right kind of return, you end up having something that looks a little bit like a real return bond, so that it goes up with inflation and mm -hmm. continues to throw off the equivalent of a coupon by way of the distributions, albeit tax efficient, which makes them even better. Well, David has set the stage. Now we're joined by a specialist in the rental real estate market. Our guest is Greg Ramont, and he's president, Centurion Apartment Reed. It's great to see you here. Great to be here. Could you give us a brief idea of how big Centurion is? What do you do? Well, we're about $100 million in assets. Uh, really what we focus on is apartment buildings only, and in Canada only. And around, around the Toronto area generally? Well, our portfolio right now is focused in, in Ontario. That's where we see a, a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's certain markets in Canada where we think are a little bit overpriced, so we're less interested in playing them. We think there's a lot to do in Ontario. Um, we tend to be a little bit of value-added player, so we're looking for apartments or properties where we can find and add value. Okay, so you want to add the value. And let's talk first about why you're in that, that area of the market to begin sure. with. Because, you know, as we set off the top, there's REITs of every type and description, right. and you're saying, no, I'm going pure play apartment. That's right. So let's talk about sort of how do apartments fill into what we started with earlier about the low correlation and the consistent returns sure. and the capital appreciation. Tell us about that. Well, I, I would say for, for, for the first, first reason I got into apartment buildings was I think that apartments are probably the most conservative investment that you can make. Mm -hmm really outside of maybe government bonds. But, you know, they, pro they provide a lot of things like stability of income, very tax efficient, uh, you know, very long track record of, of volatility and reasonable capital growth. So if you're going to be looking for any investment, I, I happen to like apartments a lot, but even in the spectrum of real estate investments, they're considered the most conservative of real estate investments. Okay, so long term, I think that you're, you're looking at a very long term horizon. Right. So how do apartments uh, react during the turbulent times that we've seen, say, in the last 50 or 60 years? Have they continued to appreciate on a, on a nice steady scale? Well, I mean, if you look at the, the IPD index uh, over the last 25 years, um, there's been consistently positive returns with never a negative year in terms of total return in the last 25 years. Now, of course, that's no guarantee that that will always be the case. But, you know, part of it is that apartment buildings are really a basic needs industry. No mm -hmm. matter what happens, people need a place to live. And mm -hmm. about one-third of Canadians, we often forget, live in rental accommodation. And that really is not going to change no matter what the economy is doing. I mean, I guess the one thing that could hurt would be a huge oversupply of new apartment buildings. But that's not happening anytime soon because developers want to build condos. That's right. That's right. And we just haven't seen that. I mean, the vast majority of Canada's rental housing stock was built in the 1960s and 70s. And very little has been done since that time. So as you drive along, say, the 401 in Toronto, and you see all of those post-war apartment buildings, that's, right. that's your bread and butter? That's our bread and butter. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they build them back then? It just that was the way they made money? Well, I mean, if, if I recall, you know, when I was growing up in, in the early 60s and 70s, someone giving away my age, but, um, you know, I, I certainly recall most of my friends living in small homes or, you know, and the people who lived in really multifamily were, were tenants. So there wasn't really a, a big condo bed. But, you know, I, I like, to, like to think that part of the reason that this business evolved is that condo developers figured out, not just recently, but, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that they could certainly make a lot more money <laughs> by selling condominiums to retail investors rather than selling to wholesale guys like ourselves. Sophisticated purchasers, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Look, just can you get into it now, why apartments, though? Discuss capital appreciation sure. and income. What's the split there? Around 70 to 75 percent of total return comes from cash flow income. And the, and the balance will come from capital growth. And I think the perception and you know, for most retail investors is, it's, is that it's the other way around. They look at real estate from a capital growth point of view. And for me, it's all about, it's about cash flow and income. Okay, so let's back up, because cash flow and income can be two different things, especially right. when, you, when you factor depreciation in. That's correct. Uh, one of the, you know, when you talk about the key metrics mm -hmm. that an analyst would be looking at when they're, when they're analyzing, mm -hmm. whether it's a public or a private yep. REIT, uh, they certainly would be would care about the amounts of leverage. Maybe yep. you can comment on that. But in addition to that, you hear about FFO, funds yep. from operations. Can, yep. you, can you describe why that may be more important than just looking at the income statement? Well, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things about why real estate is tax efficient is because we have something called CCA, or other people might understand that as depreciation, mm -hmm. which we can use to offset the income. Yep. So if you look at the operating statements of most 
most REITs, you'll actually see that they have very, very low taxable income, which is why their, um, their, their, their distributions are so tax efficient. So you can't focus on um, the number that is taking off this artificial depreciation because it's a non-cash expense. Right. So you have to back these things out to see what the true cash flow of that business is. Now, you have a chart for us. It's the Private Apartment Property Index. Yes, yeah, so it's, it, it's an IPD index. So that's right. Now, it shows that through the financial crisis, the actual growth or, or, or the return. It, well, what is this chart showing? Can you explain? This, this really shows the total return of apartment buildings over the last 25 years on an unleveraged basis. right? And, this, and if you look at the chart, and we've grayed out the five different... Uh, over the last 25 years, sets of financial crises from mm -hmm. the 87, the Russian crisis, the tech bubble, and the recent crash. And you mm -hmm. can see that apartment buildings have performed consistently and positively through all that. All that. Okay, so apartment buildings have performed that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sure that other income-producing real estate, some of it also has performed yes. very well. Very so then we come to the question, wait a minute, if I held a publicly traded REIT during that time, I don't remember my... Uh, my market value looking quite as steady as that. <laughs> and that's so, absolutely and, true. And so I, that leads us into the question of the discussion of what are the benefits and, and, and what, are the, what are the detractions as well uh, of, of investing in a private REIT, which yours is, mm -hmm. as compared to a, a REIT that is publicly traded? Yeah. yeah. Well, th that, that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, I invest di directly because I'm looking for a diversification away from the stock market. And I think a lot of the reason that people do invest in real estate, aside from some of the other good ideas like tax efficiency and cash flow, mm -hmm. are to have diversification away from the stock market. I'm sorry to interrupt because we're showing the REIT index on the TSX and mm -hmm. the general. And you can see they are very correlated, very correlated. if you go near a public REIT. That's, yeah. that's, exa on, Greg, yeah. that's exactly right. So, you know, this is one of the problems is that people had genuinely wanted to diversify away from stocks, hold some real estate in their right. investment portfolio, and then particularly in 2008 figured out, wait a minute, I hadn't successfully segregated my stock market risk for my real estate. It risk. became more of a sector than an asset class. That's that right. Way. That's right. Okay. So the, the, uh, you hear the other thing we see every day when we, when, we, when we open our paper and go to the business section is we say, uh, we see what, what's happening about residential real estate prices. Uh -huh. You know, the, the, a bubble and a burst in different cities yep. being poised for, for a potential burst. Is that something that I need to care about if I invest, for example, in a private apartment REIT? No, and, 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 and I'll tell you why. You know, very often when I'm asked the question, what do you think about the real estate market? I mean, I, I try to back people up and say there is no such thing as the real estate market because mm -hmm. all real estate is local. Mm -hmm. And most people's perception when they're talking about the real estate market, they're talking about single family homes and condominiums. And single family homes and condominiums are priced based on perceptions, what people are willing to pay. There's no necessarily income link to the value of that real estate, mm -hmm. whereas commercial properties are valued based on their ability to generate cash flow, which is far less volatile than individual sentiment. So, you know, while I, I, I agree with you, I think that we are in a bubble for residential real estate. I think that has very little impact on the ability of apartment REITs or office towers to, to be able to generate their cash flows. Now, you guys obviously take a cut. You take your management fee Absolutely. and there's expenses and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Why wouldn't I just buy a condo or a house myself? Well, and, <laughs> and rent it out. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay, this, is, this comes to a real sticking point of mine is that I don't believe that houses and condominiums are investment-grade property. Okay? If you look at who you compete against when you're buying a condo or a home, really you're, you're competing against people who make that or purchasing that, that asset for a home. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that I buy apartment buildings as a home for my money, not as a home for me. And I think a lot of other people, when you're competing for, um, you've got two groups and 80% of the people are buy, buying a condo or a home are homeowners. So they'll pay a, a crazy price they because could they fall in love price. with it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So they're not making a rational financial decision. So if you decide to buy a condo, and I think you'll find that these, these numbers um, if you if you run the numbers, the yields that are available are exceedingly low, right. and the asset volatility is, is much higher than in, in, in um, the commercial. Oh, okay, so Greg Roman convinces me that that rather than doing that, I should go get an apartment building. Yeah. 
So everyone thinks they can do everybody else's job. Yep. And uh, it seems pretty easy to me. I can buy an apartment building and fill it up with tenants and, wow. and, and collect the rent. <laughs> so why am I not just going to go and buy an apartment building and skip the part where I have to pay you the management fee? Well, I guess if you needed heart surgery, you could go and read a book and try and do it yourself <laughs> too. But, you know, most people have day jobs. And I, I fully believe one of the things, you know, I went through a learning curve when I started this business years ago mm -hmm. as... Any investor starting something new is going to spend money and time. And assuming that they're going to do this full time, it's, it's, which is very few people who can actually do that. Most people will be better served with a managed product where they're not going to make the mistakes. Because honestly, if you try and buy an apartment building as an outsider, you know, you're not hooked into a network. The only properties you're going to get a chance to see are the ones that have been seen and already rejected by the professionals. <laughs> Picked over. Yeah. That's right. We're almost out of time. Um, what happens when interest rates go up? What happens to this asset class when interest rates go up? Well, I mean, the first, first thing, I think we've got fairly limited risk for the next couple of years of, of interest rates moving up. The, the other thing is, um, you know, most of the managers in this business are, are five- and ten-year funding-based, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not funding based on the Bank of Canada rate. Mm -hmm. So as long as we have a move that is, I think, anticipated and not unexpected or violent, then you know the market will adjust. So focus on the five-year rates, not the 30-day rates. That's right. And they're substantially less volatile. And you can you see what's happened. You know, the Bank of Canada has raised 75 basis points, and five-year funding is cheaper than it was when they started the process. Greg, you're a fascinating guy. You worked in derivatives for Sizi yeah. as well in Asia. We don't have time to get <laughs> yeah. into that, but I hope you'll come back soon because you, you give, you've given us loads of insight. Thank you. Greg Ramont of Centurion REIT. Well, coming up, it's time for you to have your say on alternative investing. We'll be taking your emails next. Plus, we'll tell you why you won't want to miss a minute of next week's show. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I'm here with David Kaufman, president of Westcourt Capital. Time now for your emails. Email number one from Mark. I'm an accredited investor and have been working with an advisor at a major Canadian bank for more than 10 years. I'm nearing retirement, very interested in deriving income. In our discussions about my financial plans, he has never raised the idea of investing in alternatives. Why do you think that is? That's a great question, Mark. Going back to last week when we had Jim Bullong uh, talking about asset mm -hmm. allocation, we started by saying that for all those people for whom you know, yield is the most important thing in capital preservation at this stage in, in their life, in their investing uh, uh, spam, uh, that, that it was hard to derive that kind of yield from traditional investment, which is why alternatives were, were probably the right thing at the right time. That said, it's, the, the, I keyed in there to Mark's point that he's with a, with a bank advisor. And let's talk about what that means. The uh, majority of, of non-pros, so normal Canadian investors, whether they be high net worth or not, do work uh, with big brand name advisors, mm -hmm. whether it be at a bank or a large brokerage house. And those advisors are only allowed to sell products or place their clients in products that are on the approved list. And getting on the approved list is, can be very difficult at some of the larger banks and a little bit easier at some of the independent brokerage houses. But in either event, it's not an easy thing to do. And one reason for that is that many alternative investments are private, meaning that in order to be on the approved list, there's a lot of heavy lifting that mm -hmm. those, that those uh, compliance people have to do to make sure that these are the types of products that can be on their shelf, which is what they talk about. When you add to that the fact that most advisors are playing in the same playing field to begin with, it's not alternatives other than publicly traded alternatives like publicly traded REITs and potentially some commodities, which come up all the time. Other alternative investments, such as some hedge funds, private equity, mortgage funds, especially private ones, are not things that come up day to day in, their, in, in, in the world in which they currently operate. So what I would advise Mark to do is... If you've been with your advisor for 10 years, you obviously touch, uh, trust him or her. And the, so what I would advise you to do is go to your advisor and say, hey, what about alternatives? It's okay to raise the question, ask them to do some homework, and then see if uh, maybe uh, they can't fit into your portfolio. Well, let's talk about next week's show. Who have we got coming up? Next week, we have uh, Chris Foster from Blackheath Fund Management to talk about a very important and compelling area of alternative investment, but also a very complex one, which is managed futures. 
which is all about uh, the use uh, uh, of futures, uh, futures contracts for investors to basically diversify um, among asset classes and achieve absolute returns without, uh, uh, w without placing too much of their capital at risk in a highly volatile environment. My um, <clears throat> understanding is that Chris Foster was a neighbour of Eric Regulis, the Globe columnist, and so we'll have to give him our condolences. Imagine living next to Regulis. <laughs> anyway. that, that must make him qualified. <laughs> no, Regulis has long <laughs> actually sung, sung his praises. Look, we're almost out of time. You were involved in condominiums for quite a while, so you know a bit about real estate valuation. So what did you think of Gre what Greg I thought, had to say? I thought that was great. I was involved in the condominium sales area and, yeah. and development for a number of years. And it, it, it is really two different worlds, because when a developer says we're going to we're going to develop a, a project. We're going to use uh, the right the right blend of uh, of equity and debt to create a, a product which can sell hopefully quickly. Uh, and and then you build it, you sell it, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what Greg is doing is something quite different. You than sit that, on the course. asset. You, you're you buying milk it. it over many years. Yeah. yeah. If you were to ask Greg, you know, an important question, which is how long do you intend to hold those assets for? He would just say forever. Yeah. Uh, because that's sort of what they're intended to do. So I learn I, I learn a lot from Greg every time I speak with him because he. Has has these special insights into the two sides of the, of the real estate market. And apparently another factor with condos potentially being overpriced, you're competing with overseas buyers, maybe from Asia, who just don't care what they pay. They just want to park the money somewhere safe and they don't care about income. So they're willing to bid up the asset. Yes, they like Canadian dollars and they're willing to buy at what we refer to as a zero cap. In other words, if you're competing against them, you're barely going to cover your mortgage payment if you plan to rent out that condo after you close. Because this is a person who'll pay a price. They don't care if they get zero yield. That's the okay. Unit. They're yeah. parking their money in Canada in Canadian dollars, and they they know that it's safe, and they hope that they'll have maybe some appreciation along the way. So they're playing the appreciation game almost exclusively because the net rent is basically zero. We're almost out of time. Is it a kind of a lie that's been peddled that owning a home is necessarily a great investment? I, I wouldn't. I think it's misleading. Yeah. I, I, and and it's, it, we can have a discussion. I'm sure we will one day about whether you're better off renting or buying for your own for when you invest in where you live. Yeah. But that's an entirely different question. Of course, it's an undiversified asset, and it's not really an investment if you're living there. And we can talk about yeah. that anytime. It's for savings. I mean, that's a good thing for a lot of people. Absolutely, it is. David, always great fun. It's Thanks great very to much. Be here. David Kaufman of Westcourt Capital. We are out of time. Uh, on alternative investing. Uh, remember to email us uh, alternativeinvesting at bnn.ca and we'll be back next Friday at 11.30 Eastern, 8.30 Pacific. Have a great weekend, everybody.